Good afternoon and welcome to the third instalment really of the ISO 9001-2015 planning and leadership element. Uh, my name's Jude and I'll be with you for the next sort of 45 minutes to deliver that and go through it with you. So for those of you who are new to NQA, uh, you might be aware that we're a global certification body and hopefully you can listen with confidence uh, to this webinar as we're in the top three in the UK for the four core standards of quality, environment, health and safety and information technology. And you will get a copy of these slides at the end um, so you can look through at leisure and these certification training services we're now offering um, advanced courses and basic training in these so if it's an area that you or your business might be thinking of looking into then feel free to contact us uh, once you've got some more information or find out a bit more information about it so as we go through this presentation um, I may receive questions in the box um, but I'm more likely to go through them at the end unless there's anything totally burning and urgent and at the end there will be an opportunity for a question and answer and you'll then get a recording of the webinar and also a copy of the slides once the webinar is closed. So what we're going through today is a practical implementation of roles and responsibilities and dealing with issues within leadership. Now to be honest with you I was going to add uh, a few other topics in there but once I started writing it, uh, it it's just sort of taken on a, a little world of its own because as I've noticed in the past two months auditing now we're coming out of lockdown what's become quite apparent is that we are currently in a state of change business-wise so don't believe everything that you hear in the press about it's all negative and it's all a bit miserable What's really encouraging, and I think the press have actually reported on this, is that manufacturing has possibly not been more busy for us in the UK since the 1970s. And conscious that we don't all work in the manufacturing se sector, but it's a really encouraging sign that, in fact, the economy and employment are going to be getting back to normal. Conscious also of the fact that there are a few issues with supply chain at the moment for people wanting to get materials and other issues which are going on but it's a positive sign that business and commerce is, is now moving in the right direction and who would have thought just 12 months ago we were sat probably quite worried and, and not too sure about how things were going to recover we're now in that phase hopefully We've also no noticed that employers have been more responsive to mental health. So th there's been lots of courses on mental health first aid and recognising issues with employees in the company for years now. But actually, it's over probably the past 12 months. This has become quite a pertinent thing for leaders of business to look into um, and heard some lovely stories from business owners and senior management about how they've been part of actually identifying issues with staff and being able to signpost them to people who are qualified to deal with issues. Generally, it has been as a result of lockdown, whether it's been isolation, uh, whether it's triggered previous issues or alcohol problems, very, very real uh, human issues, which I, I think at some point will have all felt either a little bit lonely, scared, or just generally uncertain. And I think possibly the good thing that's come out of the lockdown is it's certainly humanised a lot of people in business. And that ties us quite nicely to the social responsibility aspect of business, which has become quite critical to business image. So I think we've all been very grateful, those of us who have managed to remain in employment, managed to keep the business going, and a lot of companies now are giving back and, and wanting to help those less fortunate, NQA included. I know we've certainly um, provided a lot of money to food banks and various charities over the past 14 months, which is probably more than we would normally do, but we have always done something. I've heard fabulous stories about quite small businesses, actually, uh, hiring vans to pick up waste for people who can't get to the tip or, you know, have got large families and just having rubbish, rubbish pile up getting shopping for people who were shielding and you know I, I think it's it's certainly 
a positive change that is worth recognising and, and shows a good sign of leadership. We're continuing to adapt to a balance of work from home and necessary attendance on premises as well. So um, I don't think I've dealt with a company yet where everybody in the company is, is totally back on site yet and it's all gone back to the way it was before lockdown. It seems quite significant that where we can still work from home and people want to work from home, whereas before that would have been unheard of in a lot of places, that, that's now starting to be quite a normal and nobody bats an eyelid, which is great. And just while we're on that, actually, um, I've been out to site this week, which has been fantastic, uh, just to do an operations part of an audit and then come back and done the rest remotely. And that's worked really well for the company. So we are finally getting back out onto the road to clients who actually want to see us or want us on site. Um, and I have to say, with them providing their risk assessment a couple of weeks in advance for COVID really helped that process and I think helped everybody feel a little bit safer and a bit better that uh, everybody knew what was expected of them. I'm sure most of you will have also noticed environmental benefits of uh, the past sort of 12, 14 months. Hopefully your fuel bills are down, your lighting bills are down. I'm sure they're going to go straight back up. <laughs> But it, again, has been something within the leadership, most pe people that I've spoken to, uh, certainly in the last two months, things have become a little bit more back to normal, something that they're now actively thinking about. So there's lots going on uh, for leaders of companies at the moment. So it stands to reason then that it's probable as practice and markets change, so must roles, requirements and training. And you might have noticed uh, if you've been to one of my previous webinars that I'm using this sort of value chain model again. And the reason that I do that is because it's good to separate the different functions within the business. It doesn't matter about your business size, you're likely to have most of these in place. So when we looked at it last time, we went through that the bottom part of the diagram is your money makers, for want of a better word. These are the sections which are going to receive product, make product, get the product out, get the orders in, and then deal with customers in aftercare. And then the top part of the diagram, that's all the services and functions which will allow these money-making functions to run smoothly, cohesively, and hopefully slickly. Now, if you look at that as a whole, then actually there's a lot of roles there and different responsibilities. So actually managing all these differentiations and making them work together is quite an interesting challenge which is often overlooked. So looking at the diagram we've just looked at, there's, there's obviously the inputs and it runs right the way through the outputs. But for the imp inputs to be effective, the roles have to be clear. How often when I'm on an audit and I'll say, what do we do with roles and responsibilities? I'll be handed a job description or an organisational chart. And there's nothing wrong with that. But if we have a look at a job description versus a clear role and responsibility, what we'll hopefully find over the next few slides is that they're actually quite different. And it's, it's not always what the standard's looking for. With the impact of the commerce and the country opening, Thankfully, recruitment is something that a lot of companies are currently looking at because the supply and the demand is, is just through the roof. And this is absolutely fantastic stuff. Um, often something we don't think about with recruitment is that it's probably actually a sales task. <clears throat> and I don't mean that that salespeople will go out and look for these things. It's, it's a, more of a management or HR function. But what we're attempting to do is sell the company to get the right candidate for the position. And poor recruitment and having to re-recruit is actually quite a significant cost or it can turn out to be. So please do think about if your recruitment is constantly unsuccessful, this might be a process that you want to re-evaluate. So this is just a basic job description that I have pulled off the internet. I haven't written it myself. And it's a little bit uh, 
you know of a, of a shopping list isn't it so it'll tell us exactly what that person is going to do for day-to-day -day activities but it doesn't actually provide us too much with what their role will be and what they'll be responsible for as such but it'll tell us what their day-to-day -day they're expected to do as a function of the company and of the business need we'll always ask for qualifications as well won't we so will want to know that they can actually physically do the job itself so obviously if we were hiring for a managing director the set of skills and qualifications would be quite different to what it is for an administrative coordinator but equally the roles and responsibilities are going to be very different again so just to clarify this point slightly for you we can see the description tells a candidate the current or the current job holder what activities they're expected to do but the standard is a little bit like the law. It tells you what you need to do or what not to do, but it doesn't tell you how to do it. So if you present a job description, say as uh, this is how someone knows their role and responsibility, what it'll often not help us with is how it engages, directs, support people, supports people to the contributing effectiveness of the quality management system or how it supports other relevant management roles to demonstrate leadership as it applies to their area of responsibility so at this point you probably wondered well what are you talking about <clears throat> what it's telling us from that point in the standard is that each role within the company has a quality responsibility so it's not so much about whether it's your responsibility to answer the phone or open the post or create a spreadsheet or a business strategy <clears throat> it's telling us our quality responsibility but in order for us to set that and provide a clear set of expectations we need to know what they are ourselves so everybody in the company is responsible for quality and quality reporting okay so what that means is that everybody within the company should have a knowledge of what the quality management system is what the purpose of the quality management system is and how they convey the outputs of the quality system and to whom everybody's responsible for identifying non-conformance and i always say this on every webinar it's an awful word non-conformance it sounds really aggressive and really harsh but in actual fact we know that all it means is that actually there's something in the process that hasn't quite worked as well as it could do or should do it's not about reporting a person or making it into a personal uh mistake for want of a better word everyone is responsible for customer service so even if you're out driving in a van you're responsible for that van the image of the van you're responsible for that contact with the customer the person who's doing the administration needs to be doing it professionally correctly because everything that the business does will impact on perception of customer and everyone is responsible for being part of the quality management system as well so although as the owners and the leaders of the quality management system and leadership yes you're there to direct that the same as the rest of the business but we really have to drill home to people that nobody who is employed by the company is excluded from these quality management system processes and the ethos so the problem the big problem that we come across a lot is that the, these things are not effectively communicated to employees which would automatically mean a non-compliance right but we don't often raise it because we, we will see that you know maybe our policies on the wall or objectives are on the wall or a plethora of many different things i would challenge a lot of places to say though that they 100 percent do it effectively but we can eliminate the issue and automatically improve the process and save hidden costs as well so we can do annual quality awareness and you probably do this for health and safety so look we all know how to lift a heavy box right or 
how to assess whether you need something to assist you with that. But it's good to do it each year because it focuses the mind sort of after nine months after your training we can all fall into bad habits lift things incorrectly and it's exactly the same with quality we can find ourselves cutting corners we can find ourselves deviating from the process and it's often good to just get everybody together and refresh this is why we do what we do and you get a good communication back hopefully as well we can look at inductions probably one of the most important elements with employees so they have to have an expectation of what the company is going to provide and how you operate and part of that and often missed is quality which makes no sense really because you're asking them to follow processes and procedures yeah but what we're not doing is saying this is why we do this because and of course I think we've probably all been there either we've worked somewhere else and come into somewhere new and think well where are used to work we did this better or you know managing somebody with that experience you think oh you know this is our system you're not working where you used to be this is how you have to do it so it's a really important feature of the induction to just go through what your system is and why you certificated the importance of it to the company it might allow you to trade it might be something you're quite proud of uh, or it might be a requirement of your customers. Positive non-conformance reporting and analysis. So like we said before, we don't want to make non-conformances about a blame game. You did this wrong. This is terrible. Um, and I'm going to write it down and review it at management review so everybody knows about it. That's not what it's about. And all it will do is make people hide things. Positive non-conformance reporting might lead to discovering hidden costs and wouldn't it be great you know sort of after 12 months that you could go back to your staff and say thanks for reporting all of these issues that you found you've just saved the company x amount uh, this is a positive thing and this is why we need you to do it and hopefully it's, it's about knocking that culture and it's still out there a little bit where people don't want to just highlight where the issues are or hide it, it's, it i think it goes against human nature we, we don't want to feel we've ever done anything wrong do we so it's really important that we drill that into the staff and, and part of that good induction and quality awareness, that reinforcement that nobody's going to get into trouble for a non-conformance or a process error. Follow the process. It's the process that, that isn't working, not what you're doing. We can look at process and obstacle removal and analyse that as well. So if a process is operating well, then we certainly know that it will be effective. But then how do we find out how well it actually works? So we're going to go through that. So dealing with the issues that we come across in uh, leadership from a process aspect, this is a little tool that I'm going to show you that you might want to use. Uh, purposes of it are to A, engage your staff, B, have a look at if there are any issues within your process. Uh, we, we know that there are issues in most processes, to be fair. And what we do is we look at it and say, well, it's always worked that way, so we don't need to do anything. And it's, it's just, you know, an area that gets bypassed, probably because it's quite time consuming. But let's say we want to look at the sales process and we want to increase 10% by month end of sales. And this might be part of your quality objectives as well, to be fair. So you might say, we want to increase revenue. We want to reduce non-conformance, <clears throat> excuse me. We want to do something that will have a measurable output. And we're gonna look at what the, the condition is now and what the obstacles are. So this is a really good tool that you can use uh, to really drill down processes within the system for which you claim accountability for. So don't forget within the, the section of leadership within the standard, it asks you, you know, to have confidence that your processes work, that they're effective, but also that everybody who uses those processes is supported and they understand them. So this might be a way that you want to use to actually evidence it to the auditor, but also get a, a good 
output as well that will actually produce some value for you. So what we've found is that we've, we're going to look at the sales department and we want to increase 10% by month end and we might want to continue doing that every month it will be up to you to decide that's what I'm telling you that's what you've wanted to do I know I've just made it up really haven't I but um, pop a table table such as this together and what you're going to do is record a date and a step of what you expect what happened when you did it and what you learned from it so what we've identified in our hypothetical situation is that the lowest seller working on outbound three minutes per call <clears throat> that's what they should be doing okay what we expect is leadership and management is often not what happens okay so this is the issue what we're going to expect is that the seller will follow a procedure and complete x amount of closes within that day Okay, so we're going to observe the process and what we see happens is maybe the, the seller or the salesperson takes 15 minutes on one call and therefore, according to our three minute per call process, they've missed four other opportunities. On initial look at that, what we might learn is that the problem is not ability in terms of sales, but it might be the willingness to follow a procedure. And this could happen in any part, any aspect of the business. It might be somebody in production on a line. It might be somebody in procurement, not getting the best price or so you think or, or not getting through things quick enough. So we go back to the first step then and what the date is and what we're going to do. That, so the next step is we're going to discuss this with the person doing the sales and find out the opinions. Now, commonly in our next section, what we're going to expect is the seller is going to be negative about the procedure and take the opportunity maybe to rubbish the company. I'm not following it because it's a load of rubbish and it doesn't work. That's probably what most of us do expect when we, we perceive somebody is not following a procedure. So then we're going to record what actually happens from that. And what we find is that the seller was actually wanting to build a firm relationship with the customer improve the understanding of what the customer need is and by getting this information what they found is it's previously helped close with other clients so what did we learn as leadership as leaders from this well we shouldn't be too quick to judge motives and talking has actually helped us understand that they want to do a good job so maybe a mistake we could often make in leadership is you think oh someone doesn't want to do it but not many people come into work thinking i hope i really do a bad job today and, and upset everybody so we're going to revise back to well what do we do next so we're going to look review previous month sales and call time versus contracts we expect that long calls logs will have the length of the call may reflect in the value of the sale that was closed what happens complaints mistakes and issues are the lowest from the seller and they receive high customer satisfaction. What did we learn? We found that areas can be improved in the process from sales to production. Okay, so the, the purpose of this tool and exercise is to start with what you perceive to be a problem and work through stage by stage by stage. So often what we will hear uh, in relation to issues is uh, people went by in, they don't like the process, they think they can do it better well they're the ones using it so they possibly can and certainly with this example um it, it's it's made up but it's based on conversations that i've had with people uh, over the past three years by in, interrogating that process and by listening to what a the results say and b what the user of the process says what we've actually done is we've combined departments there. So we've, we've worked out that the three minutes on the call might be too quick. As a result of that, we've seen that we make mistakes with orders. That's gonna affect production. It's gonna affect the customer. And then ultimately, you might be hitting your three minute target, but was it productive? Did it make any sense? So it forces then the leadership to go back and look at it and say, okay, well, what, 
if we give them longer, give them autonomy on the call, what should happen is less mistakes at production, happier customers, return of sale. So what we learn at the end of it is the moving towards the target of the extra 10% by a month end. It's a combination of leadership, sales team and production. And it's so important that we listen to the process owners because it, it, it doesn't take a great deal to change a process. We just get everybody involved. If we look at it from a point of view of how you're perceived in leadership by the main body of work, normally when we look at the, uh, the pyramid of hierarchy, we'll see that top management is always the small part at the top. Let's invert it. If you had this on your walls, perhaps, within wherever you work, what it shows is that the, the top management is the smallest amount of people. And then above them, you've got your team leaders and your supervisors, but the main core of your staff are going to be your main body of key workers. So that's your main group of opinions, your main group of people who can perform your processes, and probably the main group of people who are going to deal directly with your customers. The other two are never going to have the capacity that the main body of workers have to have that amount of impact. So when we lead, the purpose of this really is to show we lead humbly that we are the smallest part of that cog of the machinery because relying on all the many cogs of the main bodies to actually implement this system that we are asking them to and do it correctly. So we really need to look at taking the time to work on processes and understand the importance with the process users and ask why do we do this in such a way. Another method you could use is to put together a chart similar to this and again I've gone with a simple process such as picking and I say it's simple but then once you start actually pulling the process apart it becomes uh, multifaceted, there's more to think about than, than you realise. So we're going to have the important steps. Because don't forget, when you write these processes out, often what us auditors will do is we'll say, show me an order and provide me your procedure. And we'll read the procedure with the documentation that you've handed us. More often than not, there's deviations, but they're not included in the, in the procedure. And so that leads us to ask a few more questions. Why? Well, the reality of business and life is that you can't have such a specific procedure with such a broad range of customers and products that most of our clients actually have. So you might want to go through the procedure with your employees and say, for example, what's the most important step starting? So, okay, we receive the picking order. What are the key points of it? We need to check the stock, amount, location, and consider weight and transport. Are other departments involved? We've then got to go to the location, make sure we've got lifting equipment, and we've got uh, forklift truck drivers, maybe cherry pickers involved. Pick the order, check for damage, confirm correct. Goods in may be affected by this or a part of that process. And then you take the order to dispatch, print labels off, attach item to identify. All sounds really simple. So looking at that, People who work in manufacturing will look at that and think I can approve that instantly. And you're absolutely right. I'm afraid it's not something I do uh, on a daily basis. But let's see what we can take away from it. What can we actually consider to improve that process and eliminate hidden costs? Do we know what the most ordered items are close to dispatch and packing? How have we arranged the layout for the most efficient process? And again, we're using manufacturing, but this can apply to any process which you have that is important that you think, oh, can we make that a bit slicker? Does the picking have adequate resource to enable a quick and safe movement? So forklift drivers, are we making the most of available technology? Often this is overlooked. So we look at maybe the cost of a, a new software or technology, which, you know, they're never, never cheap but over a period of time would these improvements actually pay for that and bring a benefit to the business how much extra work 
do we make for ourselves on the current process that we're using? So let's say, just as an example, just purely on your layout of, of your premises, do you have your highest selling item right at the back of the warehouse that, okay, whoever's doing the collection, they're gonna get the steps in every day and be nice and healthy, but how much time does it actually cost you to do that? And is there an easier way of presenting things to make it easy for your workers, therefore make it easier for your customer because we can do things quicker. Do departments work together or are they siloed? So that was the purpose really of this. So if, for example, we go to our location and we check the damage, if it is damaged, where did the process go wrong? Was it checked at goods in? Is it required to be checked at goods in? So any chink in the armour at any stage of these key points, it may have come from a different department. Do the other departments understand the requirements of your department? And this is often again where things may fall down because what the purchasing team needs, the information they need to ensure that they can buy things for the company, materials, stock, softwares, whatever it is, is that communicated with other areas of the company who might not understand why you need all of this information. You know, I've given you a product code, surely you can just go online and, and order it that way. And it's often these miscommunications or lack of overall understanding of the system that holds things up and may cause non-conformances or even friction between people. So it's quite important if we go back to the beginning and have a look at that quality awareness training we're not just talking about this is a policy, this is the objective, we're certificated to ISO 9001. It's looking at the process interaction as well. And if you've got that audience of people who are using those interactions, that's when we're going to start getting feedback. And, oh, I didn't realise you needed that, you did it like that. Or, oh, OK, well, actually, you provide us with this, we don't need it, we don't even look at it. And so... We're reducing issue, we're reducing refining and cutting down rather than increasing paperwork and increasing jobs for people. Again, you might recognise this uh, chart from the first leadership session that we did last year, actually. I think it was this time last year. OK. And the element of change. So we've gone from being an Amazon responsive country, haven't we? I order it on my couch on a, a Friday evening. I expect whatever it is to arrive on my front door Saturday morning and then COVID hit. And suddenly I, I just expect I might be wasting a few weeks for something or a few days or something's going to be out of stock for a while. And I'm not going to get too upset about it because I know there's a global pandemic. Slowly but surely, <laughs> the Amazon effect is coming back. Now we're all up and running and coping with back to normal again and what we talked about last time was how to keep your business current how to keep it relevant and by making these little small process changes by engaging your staff by leading from the front by listening and leading humbly and ensuring people know what that role is within the system you'll find that you're automatically going through the changes and hopefully you will surpass phase four by not adapting in, in terms of ensuring what role people do you, your system will stagnate and eventually it will start to go downhill and that's where issues start and and all kinds of things can happen So reviewing, it's research year for many of you. And last year, exactly the same side, this was about continuation of services. I'd like to put it to you again, but this, this time as a continuation of your system to make your system better. So building on the familiar can be a mistake. Why do we do this? Because we've always done it that way. Why? Because we've always done it is not a good answer. Review your process, make sure people are aware of it, make sure that people are involved and listen to ideas from people 
who want to be involved and are going to use that process. Beware of core rigidities. So over time, processes become rigid and becomes difficult to change and embed. It's important you explain changes to staff with the emphasis of why. People aren't really interested in just being told what to do because you have to do it. If you understand it, you can improve it and you can be engaged in. One of the processes you may look at, if you look at the purchasing process, will be your suppliers as well and reviewing relationships. And whilst long-standing relationships with customers are great, it may restrict your ability to change and enter new markets with new suppliers and gain new customers. So it's really important, this constant review, constant refresh. And what we find with that always is we get new ideas. There might be new markets you can move about in and emerge. There might be a new set of customers, but we might be held back sometimes because customers demands or they, they don't want to pay as much as you want to, to charge if you're looking to sort of move up the price bracket. You have to evaluate and look at it. Loyal custom cost cutting and higher efficiency may have hidden issues within the company stability. OK, so by not looking at the performance of your, of your process, by not looking at the performance of the service, it can actually hide issues. So just because we have 5000 orders a week, are they 5000 orders that actually bring something in to the company or bring something of benefit or are we constantly having to pay more for supplies, but actually reduce price for the stuff to go out to the customer? And it's really important to keep that fresh in your mind. So to conclude, what we've discussed has covered business strategy for planning and leadership. And although the language is different, it's exactly what 9001 is all about. So taken directly really from the standard, what we've discussed covers planning to address risks and opportunities from a process point of view, setting objectives. So we looked at um, perhaps looking at a process, what you want out of that process. There's nothing wrong with that being a quality objective. How that's going to bring value to the business, how you're going to communicate it and the, the process of planning that. We've looked at evaluating the success of the planned changes as well by breaking things down and seeing is there a difference can we improve further? And again, accountability. Leadership is what it says on the tin. It's all got to come from you. And although we've done the inversion where we've looked maybe at uh, how we can look out at the business and reach the main body so that we can communicate the system, it's still you guys at the top that need to filter that information down. And we've looked at the QMS being successful and that processes are integrated because we've looked at, well, is there a silo effect? Can one department communicate with the other? Do the processes work into departments as well? And as part of that, of course, you've communicated to the staff their assigned role and responsibility and they're where they sit within the quality system itself. So thank you very much for listening. If you need any further uh, help with uh, your systems, we've got lots of different resources at the moment and, and quite a few free. So we've got in implementation guides. You'll get a copy of these slides so you can look further into these. Uh, we've got advanced courses as well, which are to help you improve not only your systems, but also how you think about business as well, which are these. These are the topics. And again, you can look through all of these in your own own time and contact us if there's anything that you would like to know more on. Thank you very much. I uh, can't see that there's any questions in the box. Give a couple of moments just in case anybody has any. Nope, that's super. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your Friday. Bye bye.